Hi, I'm Nancy Howell with Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society, and you know, we've been doing a number of interviews, and, and we have a fantastic person that I'd like to have us interview today and, and have us speak with us, uh, Tom Terrell, who is the CEO and founder of Great Lakes Biomimicry. What does that mean, biomimicry? And I'm, I'm sure Tom will tell us a lot more about it. So welcome, Tom. Thank you so much for, for joining us here. Um, I think the first question is, let's learn a little bit more about you and your interests and your background. Well, um, I come from a big family and uh, was the oldest and spent a lot of time in the outside. You know, so spending a lot of time with birds and animals and always learned to love it. Uh, I've lived 18 places in the United States, so I've gotten a chance to see different regions and appreciate tremendously what we have here in Northeast Ohio. Um, most of my time was spent in the steel industry, and then I transitioned into getting regionalism, getting involved in regionalism, um, and very much in the nonprofit area. I picked up on biomimicry about seven years ago when I found the work working on a major project for Cuyahoga River Initiative. Oh, wow. And um, I didn't know what it was. And I investigated. I bet a lot of people don't. You know, yeah. You know, I was. I'm an entrepreneur, and I've started maybe 12 businesses. And so, entrepreneur, I looked at that word. I went back and studied it, and I said, "This is a big deal, and this is going to change the world." And one, I want to be part of it. And two, I think our region is uniquely situated from a place based standpoint to be a center of this from an educational, yeah. educational, and edu uh, economic development standpoint. Absolutely, we've got a lot of organizations, whether it's museums, we've got a number of colleges and universities that would just man. I I, I could see them eating that up. All right, so let us find out a little bit more. What is biomimicry and what does it mean? And, and Biomimicry comes from uh, two Greek words, bios meaning life and mimesis meaning to imitate. And very simply stated, it means to imitate nature. Nature is 3.8 billion years old. Uh, and in fact, that's three point years of R&D. And we, uh, we, as a, we as a civilization, especially the last 200 years, have kind of been um, antithetical towards nature and ignored it. In fact, done things exactly the opposite of what nature would do. And today we're paying the price with things like global warming, etc. What biomimicry does is it brings you back into thinking about nature when you're looking at solving a problem, whether it be a manufacturing problem, a production problem, an operating problem, an organizational design problem. And there are examples in nature for most, almost everything that you would want to change. Wow. Uh, it doesn't mean it's going to solve every problem, but our objective is to create conditions for innovation through biomimicry. We're not shoving it down people's throats. We're teaching them, we're training them, we're giving them the tools to do it, and then we want them to begin to use it themselves so we can move on and help other people uh, work on that process. And the more people we are able to get to learn to look through a biomimic lens, and when they rent, run into a problem, ask what would nature do, the more open it becomes as far as being able to use this to solve some of the world's problems. Interesting. Wow. I think one, one thing that pops into my mind is uh, wetlands. Mm -hmm. uh, so many times, and I know I teach a bit about wetlands when I'm working with students, um, and you know how much, many wetlands we've lost or have been modified so they're not wetlands anymore and they don't do right. what they're supposed to. Because I hear wetlands are like a sponge that will help to hold water. They, they won't allow water flowing faster and you know let things sink in. And we have a bioswale at the Natural History Museum that was just put in to go along with the holding some of the storm water that would, would come down. So is, is that something like Biomimicry? Very much so. Uh, what you said about, about wetlands is exactly what happens. It also does regenerate um, as far as activists with environmental issues. It absorbs things. You can go ahead and cleanse the areas mm -hmm, that it's in. Mm -hmm. uh, to that end, we are involved in a project with the Cleveland Water Alliance here, the Ohio Department of Natural Resource, and an organization called Biohabitats out of Baltimore, which is the foremost uh, organization in the country on the re-engineering and restoration of wetlands. And uh -huh. they're coming in to do a major project in the Cuyahoga River. But next year, they're going to take on the, the south side of the south coast of Ohio um, and Lake Erie and be able to look at it for just what you're saying about how can we go ahead yeah, and stop yeah. these flows sure. through using soft and hard surfaces and much of it would be wetlands restoration. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's fascinating. So with biomimicry we're looking at, at big pictures like wetlands or forests. Are we also looking at individual organisms, a certain type of plant, a certain type of animal? 
Uh, absolutely. Um, there's many, many examples of how you, you could use nature. Um, s things that are relatively simple and neat. Uh, for example, birds, f and, and just interested, to, very interesting to your listeners, birds smacking into windows yes. and breaking their necks. And we all feel guilty, and I'm sure your group feels more guilty than most do in that process. I know my wife has problems with that. Well, a company named Ornolux designed a window that has a spider web that's built into the spider, into the window. Spider webs give off UV. Birds never fly into spider webs. So they embedded the same type of design giving off UV. Huh. You can't see it. You can look through it like the window right over yeah. there and looks normal, but the birds see it and they never again fly into it. So putting it on flyways in major buildings wow. will prevent the birds from smashing oh, in fantastic. there and really save a lot of birds' lives. That's interesting because we're going to be showing or screening a documentary about migratory birds and their plight. And one of the major things is striking buildings and windows, especially at night on migration. So, wow, that's that's amazing. I'll have to look into that one for sure. Um, so we're, we're thinking about things that are around now, plants, animals, habitats. But you know, there were lots of things here long ago, dinosaurs, prehistoric fish, uh, coral. So are we looking at anything that was around a long time ago? Very much so. Um, both sides of the coin, uh, things that are present today and things that were there in the past. The ones we've kind of specialized in the past are things that um, didn't necessarily evolve and die because they weren't able to sustain their life from a natural standpoint. But many beings that we've had in our history um, were wiped out because of catastrophes. Uh, asteroid hitting the earth and killing the dinosaurs, for example, is one case in point. Many people feel that if that had not happened, dinosaurs would be alive today. Uh, birds are the direct descendants of dinosaurs and their exoske exoskeleton system, very lightweight structure, high strength, kind of low alloy type of mm -hmm. a process with my steel, uh -huh, sure, steel right, uh, right. background. Um, it's a direct derivative of what the dinosaurs were, and so consequently, there's a, a, a field called paleobiomimicry that people are getting into now. We're working on it with both the Natural History Museum and NASA, which goes back into recorded archives and takes out beings that were killed from catatoxic means, fossils example, mm -hmm. um, and looks at those and says, what do they have? What kind of manipulations did they have? What kind of motor effects did they have that will allow us to go ahead and use them where we may not have that in beings that are alive wow. today? So almost like a evolutionary, look at how things are moved along evolutionarily too. What made them better suited for a particular environment? Very, very much so. And anticipating with what we see today, what's going to take them to the next level? You right. know, hundreds and thousands of years in the future. Mm -hmm. That's that's amazing. Uh, can you maybe give us an example of maybe a, a plant or a an animal that w actually has been used uh, with uh, designing something? using biomimicry. Well, I'll give you an example. I, I'll try to stick to birds because I think it's okay. kind of nice for I like to know plants, too, because okay. you know, a lot of times people don't even think about a plant, and, and boy, that, that's they're really important, too. Well, let, me, let me give you one of each, then. Okay. Uh, there's we, we, one of our fellows, PhD fellows, started a company um, called Hegemon, and Hegemon is working on designing a, a helmet uh, structure that will prevent concussions, and this is a big active well, area sure. today. Well, there are several ways of looking at it. One is woodpeckers, because woodpeckers, thousands of times that they hit that tree, they're obviously, if we were doing it, we'd be driving our heads crazy and they're not <laughs> doing it. So they're stunning a lot on woodpeckers to determine what prevents them from having concussive, concussive um, uh, problems. And the other one is using a hedgehog. So a hedgehog, which is, you know, prey for birds in many cases, it'll climb up a tree maybe 30 feet tall and if it sees an eagle coming in it, it'll roll up in a ball, it will fall off the tree and it will bounce 30 feet high. And the reason is its spines come basically intersect with each other, it rolls in a ball so it bounces and it rolls and then they get up and move away. So the concussive oh properties of that type of a fall with a being that size is very, very significant huh. from a process standpoint. Um, there are many examples um, in, in nature. If you go into a rainforest, if you were able to go to the botanical gardens and you took a look at the way the structure was, you'll notice that small leaves are in the top and very big leaves are in the bottom. Okay. And what happens is the small leaves get hit with lots of rain, they get what they need, but much of it goes through and you have these increasing sizes of leaves that have more difficult time getting the water and catching the water. Okay. Till where you get to the bottom, you have big leaves with concave structures that basically can go ahead and absorb that and be able 
able to retain it and hold it. So it's an ecosystem that's been built there to be able to deal with water. Uh, <clears throat> there's many examples um, uh, in, in nature. Uh, another one is Moen, who is a, a shower and faucet mm -hmm. manufacturer. They looked at shower heads and decided there was no good one out there. All of them hitch in one place. They really use way too much water. So they looked at what does nature do to be able to handle water. And what they did is they looked at a sunflower. Sunflower um, grows in arid regions. It m rotates to okay. hit the sun to right. get the greatest amount of absorption of sun. But what it has in there is a pattern of, in, the, in the budding Fab Fibonacci pattern, it's right, called, right. series. And it is the most absorptive thing in in the world as far as being able to take from a plant standpoint and absorb moisture. So they designed the shower head and that Fibonacci pattern and then reversed it for water to come out. Oh my gosh. Not only did they make it very successful using less water, but they did it very inexpensively. So you'll t see it now taking up a lot of shelf space at places like Home Depot. And I'm going gonna, gonna to have like to look that. for that. Oh, that, that's amazing. You know. But it's too bad the stores just don't tout that type of thing like wow this was designed by nature yeah, but it's starting though it's okay. a, this is a it's a feel that people are really getting a feel for and um, young people catch on very quickly the other thing yeah. it's saying about is because we're doing a lot with education because of the creativity that's involved it really appeals to right brain thinking so we're having a real trouble in this country getting um, people into stem education mm -hmm. Uh, in fact, 17% of graduating engineers in the United States are female, which is extremely low. Yet, more than 60% of graduating biologists are female. And the reason is, it's much more creative on the biology side. How do you blend those two together? Yeah. How do you get that creativity and design into STEM? And that's what biomimicry does. It gets in there so people are beginning to think about things. So inner city and underrepresented populations like inner city and females be able to get much more involved in STEM education. And we think what will happen is not only in broad and STEM base, but it will begin to educate differently the people that are already there in yeah. STEM that don't have right. the creative or design side mm -hmm. that is oh, part wow. of their curriculum. Yes, right. right. I can see that. Yep. Fantastic. Um, so if I were to be uh, have, a, have a concern, a problem that I wanted to be solved using biomimicry, all right, I want to design something or I see an environmental problem, uh, what's the process? Do you say, oh, here's the problem. What do I see out there in nature? Is, is that kind of, sort well, of, kind what you do? It's, or, it's, it's kind of that or way. Or you There's call up a, somebody, hey, do you have an idea as to what to do about this? A lot, a lot of it depends at the level that you're at when you ask that question. Um, for example, we have multiple training programs uh, that we put people through, things like a one-day program called the Principles or the Value of Biomimicry, and then we have a three-day program called Principles of Biomimicry. We have a program in Organization Design and Development. That's a three-day program we put people through. But there is also a website put out by an organization that was really the start of biomimicry on a formal basis. Biomimicry has been along, around for a long, long time. And da Vinci did it right brothers oh, sure. looking, oh, at, yeah. looking okay. at birds yeah, in yeah, many yeah. cases. But they have a website called asknature.org. And if you have a question and say, gee, I want to learn how nature moves fluids, mm -hmm. you go in to ask nature. It'll come up with an archer fish and a skunk and the heart and a redwood tree, etc. And you begin thinking about how can I use these in the design of my product. Now, as you think about that, then you really don't have necessarily the skill set to be able to say, who can I go to that knows that being that I want to mimic? So we're building a base um, of database of subject matter experts in the fields that are out there, whether it be moving water or gecko technology or things like this. Gecko technology, I like that. It's an adhesive <laughs> yeah, of geckos. And, and it's not, it, not selling insurance. No, no, uh. it's not selling insurance. It's very good. I hadn't thought about that one. Um, and we can go ahead and look at that site and then you come and say, I need somebody to help me. We can refer you to somebody that can come into that and then help you in that process. But the other thing is, in educating you to be able to do it yourself, we teach you the first time and help you to do that. And then we teach you the skills to be able to do it yourself the next time and look at that process. But there are people out there that we have an organization, uh, Biomimicry 3.8, which is the, uh, the originator of Biomimicry in the U.S. It does some major corporate uh, product design programs. But there's many pieces. The AskNature.org is a great way to do it. Or to come in and talk with us um, about the very basic training program. It's a lot of fun. You walk out of there really knowing a lot more wow. than you walk in. Jazzed up, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it sounds as though uh, a lot of this training may be for high school or professionals or college, university students. What 
can we do for maybe uh, elementary school students? Can we start as early as elementary our, or, our, or, or kindergarten? Our major objective is PK through 12. That's where we specialize. Really? Pre-K? The reason is, is that, I mean, you know it. I mean, you're a teacher and you teach at the museum. Kids get it like this. Mm -hmm. When they pick up something and they like it, they drive. And I don't care whether it's a video game or playing a sport or whatever it may be. So the key is to get them in that early age to make them think about nature. Mm -hmm. When you and I were growing up, it was natural. We were outside, we were playing yep. with bugs, yep. we were playing with rabbits, you know, and we kind of outgrew that only because society said that's not important anymore. Well, society is now saying it is important. And so we want to get kids who don't have the ability to go outside the way that we did, maybe kids from the inner city or kids that are playing video games and, you know, can't really move themselves away to see nature. We want to get them in touch with nature. And once they see and get excited about it, it means all of a sudden it reverses the process and they begin to get outside and they begin to study it. So we're looking at it in two ways, informal STEM learning and formal STEM learning. The first process, and you mentioned earlier, we're in a region that has a plethora of informal science, science edu education institutions, excuse me, um, but they don't work together. And Cleveland yeah. Metropolitan School District has a great nature program for all eight years of school where they visit these various yes, facilities. Right. Can you imagine if we integrate interdisciplinary, a thread of biomimicry in that first program, the first grade process, and then take it through second grade when they visit the museum, and fifth grade when they visit the zoo, and that thread goes all the way mm -hmm. through so it becomes an inherent yeah, part yeah. of that process. What happens if you do that is we're building a generation, talent development, to be able to understand how to use biomimicry. At the same time, we're working with corporations through fellows to teach them to embed biomimicry. They're going to be changing, we're incubating new companies, we're attracting companies, we'll have the talent base to be able to fill those jobs. And we'll be the only place in the country at the moment that's really doing that, and we're eons ahead of anybody else in that process. The other side is the formal programs on K through 12, and we're working with schools in Lorain County, we're working with the Metropolitan School District here in Cuyahoga County, we're working with the Akron Public School uh, District um, in Nanderson Venters Hall of Fame School, where we have PhD fellows that are embedded with our project wow. managers educating the teachers on how to go ahead and embed it interdisciplinary. What's neat about it, this is not a bolt-on. This scares teachers to death when you see this. It, it makes it easier and more fun to teach, and it makes it easier and more fun to learn. And once we get a teacher that gets to understand that, and then we get them through our week-long training program in the summer, all of a sudden, every one of them to a person says, this will change the way I wow. teach forever. Wow. And you can see when you go and watch their classes that it has. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I think that's a real big important part of, of really even our Audubon is, is getting the young people involved, getting them to look at nature, getting them, whether it's, you know, through biomimicry or just really appreciating what is out there in the natural world. Um, you know, one more thing that kind of comes to mind for me is, you know, we're looking at animals, we're looking at plants, we're looking at ecosystems. We're losing a lot of plants and animals on this planet. We are losing ecosystems. Uh, how can biomimicry maybe help with protecting areas, protecting plants, protecting animals, so that we don't lose that, that like you say, four and a half billion years of, of R&D? Uh, we're, it's, it's kind of frightening. Well, it's additive in many ways to some of the things that are being done in sustainability, environmental aspects. Um, those try to stop it from by not doing it, by not abusing the environment, by uh, utilizing substitutes that don't contaminate the environment. Biomimicry is different in that approach that it teaches you how nature solves a problem. Nature has problems. They confront things. They have enemies that work together to solve a specific problem. Uh, what it does is it teaches collaboration, it teaches system thinking. And that's different than what we think as humans most of the time. And once we get our brains together on a cumulative basis, it's amazing what we can go ahead and solve. And so you get people who are looking at biomimicry, and it's a cohort approach. We take um, science, you know, biologists, we take engineers, we take designers, we take business people, and they're in the same room learning at the same time to be able to look through that lens. So they're not only learning from their own perspective, they're learning from the other person's perspective. So as they leave and they go back to their organizations, they're not only bringing their own science perspective, they, they're bringing what the creative person, what the designer said in that process. And you're beginning to look at the problem in a multiplicity of ways, simply then looking at it in one way, which is sustainability and that type of a process. So that really allows us to go back and look at what nature did to be able to solve problems, to be able to correct problems, to be able to clean up issues, etc. I'm a diver, and so the warming of the oceans 
and the bleaching of coral uh, from my aspect is it scares me a lot mm -hmm. because it's taking away many many lands. We've got to figure out how we can go ahead and begin to turn that problem around and it takes more than simply the, the global environment and global warming. We've got to be able to go out and look at what does nature do in those types of circumstances. And there are answers out there if you get the right people together and they spend the time to be able to look at it from a systems basis using bright and best and brightest from all areas. Yeah, yeah. I think it also maybe again starting from the pre-K level and going up um, having a, people appreciate, students appreciate, families appreciate what is out there in the natural world and we shouldn't lose this particular environment. We shouldn't lose that particular animal just because it may have something that will help us yes, eventually. Absolutely. So, yeah. Well, this has been absolutely fascinating. I I, I want to dive into it more. Uh, maybe we can get that uh, website um, on our our website so we can people can check out uh, the asknature.org. That would be yeah. great. So people can start taking a look at that. But this has been fabulous, and I really appreciate your time and uh, talking with us here for Western Cuyahoga Audubon. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, pleasure's mine. Thanks for the invitation.